Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 52nd episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring Baron Vladimir Harkonnen from Dune. The dread overlord of House Harkonnen, the Baron Vladimir, is the embodiment of gross overindulgence and power-hungry hedonism, a diabolical Machiavellian poisoning everything he touches as he pursues his singular desire to satisfy his own ambitions. In this video, we'll be exploring everything we're given about the Baron in the Dune novel, comparing the source material to the three versions of this character we've been given, those being Kenneth McMillan's portrayal in the 1984 film, Ian McNeese's in the 2000 miniseries, and Stellan Skarsgård's in the 2021 film, all of which have varying degrees of accuracy when compared to the Baron we see in the book, which I'll be highlighting at different points in this video. Despite all of its flaws, at the time of making this video, the miniseries is so far the most faithful adaptation of the novel, and therefore the most faithful representation of the Baron. Denny Villanova's version of this story and this character are magnificent, and this Baron is close but not exactly true to the character laid out for us in the book. The Lynch film embellishes quite a lot and leaves out even more, and it's been panned by critics and viewers alike, but it's achieved a cult-like status among many others. And while I don't believe this rendition of the Baron is true to his character at all, he's still technically the Baron, and it can't be ignored. Well, at least I can't ignore it. Now one thing I won't be covering in this video that may disappoint some of you is the information we receive about the Baron's background from Brian Herbert's prequel trilogy, Prelude to Dune. Now the reason for that is the fact that from what I can tell, almost every Dune novel not written by Frank Herbert is reviled by the majority of the fanbase due to them being untrue to the narrative of Dune and its characters. And these three novels are no exception. However, if there's enough interest in exploring the Prelude to Dune series, let me know down below and I'll make a video on the Baron's background at some point in the future. Before we begin, I'd like to talk to you about something I'm quite excited for, courtesy of our sponsor for this video, Amazon Prime Video. And that's their new The Wheel of Time series based on the best-selling fantasy series by Robert Jordan that premieres November 19th. I'm a huge fantasy fan, and The Wheel of Time series is by far one of the greatest fantasy epics ever put to paper. A story that's set in an expansive and incredibly detailed world. A world filled with magic, mystery, and adventure. And now after a long wait, we're finally going to see this story come to life on the silver screen. Amazon has put together this amazing interactive trailer that you're seeing on your screen now. And it's filled with audio cues that signal you to move your screen to find visual easter eggs throughout the trailer, allowing you to fully immerse yourself in the experience. As if I wasn't excited enough for this series already, this trailer has taken my excitement to the next level. You can find a link to the trailer down in the description. And after you check it out, leave a comment detailing any easter eggs you found down below, and check out the premiere of The Wheel of Time on November 19th. Thank you Amazon Prime Video for sponsoring this video. Without further ado, let's begin. Right from his introduction in the book, the Baron comes off as an egotist, his pudgy hand caressing the image of a world whose fate he holds the power to control, speaking of his endeavors in this regard to his mentat and nephew by posing the question, is it not a magnificent thing that I, the Baron Vladimir Harkonnen, do? Along with this ego, the Baron shows himself to be a prideful man as well, which is a byproduct of his ego. He has pride in his lineage and the accomplishments of his house, and a pride in his achievements. And the Baron is a man who has a partially warranted sense of self-importance, putting himself on a pedestal as a great and powerful man, the magnificent and ingenious ruler of the greatest clan in the known universe. And he is indeed powerful, holding within his grasp the might and resources of a great house that has been shoring up its wealth for nearly a century through its domination of the spice trade. We find that the Baron is prone to talking down to his subordinates while highlighting his own grandeur, recognizing their strengths and utilizing those strengths while pointing out their faults and shortcomings in comparison to his own cunning, as we see when he recognizes the talents of his mentat but simultaneously demeans him when they're discussing their plans. However, the Baron isn't exactly boastful, and he actually becomes angered with himself for boasting to Raban at one point in the novel. But he does enjoy gloating, and he derives exquisite pleasure from besting his opponents and shoving their failures in their faces. Though the Baron does have this ego, it doesn't do him too much harm, as he's a cautious and slightly paranoid pragmatist, one who utilizes manipulation, advanced planning, and an understanding of human desire to achieve his goals. The greatest example of this is how the Baron has put himself and his house in a position to realize his dream of ridding himself of his rivals, the Atreides, 
a realization that will allow them to secure unlimited wealth and the throne of the Imperium for himself and his heir. The Emperor is fearful of House Atreides and their growing power, and knowing this, the Baron has whispered into the Emperor's ear for what was likely years, promising him that his power could be secured while his own hands remain clean in the process with the help of the noble Baron. To do this, the Baron has taken measures to ensure that the Atreides are greeted by sabotage and uprising on Arrakis, stripping buildings of their usefulness and sending settlements into an uproar to distract the Atreides from the true intentions of the Harkonnens. Not only that, but he's placed spies amongst their ranks, as well as an assassin that had been planted in the Atreides' new residence for weeks, one that was sent to kill the Atreides' heir. The Baron also planned to ensure that the Duke and by extension, the other houses knew that it was he who brought down House Atreides, which highlights the Baron's cunning as he recognizes the necessity of the lesser houses knowing that it was he who brought down the Duke, knowing that he needs to instill fear into the other houses in order to secure his position. And of course, the cornerstone of this plan, his cultivation of a traitor amongst the ranks of the Atreides, a traitor whom the Baron turned to his cause by means of fear, holding the wife of Dr. Yue hostage, or so the doctor believes, in order to persuade the doctor to betray his masters in exchange for her freedom. Though this act would still have its repercussions, seeing as how the doctor enables Duke Leto to endanger the Baron's life, the Baron approaches his handling of this endeavor with the utmost caution, and he even disposes of the doctor once he's served his purpose, citing that he can't ever bring himself to trust a traitor, even one that he's cultivated himself. One thing about the Baron's character that may surprise some of you is how his pragmatic mindset gives him the capability to understand that violence should be used sparingly. And there's also the fact that violence is one thing that the Baron doesn't derive pleasure from. He cites Piter's pleasure in committing violent acts as concerning, and during that same exchange, he actually expresses his pity for Duke Leto, as the Baron knows that the plan he's concocted and the Duke's knowledge of that plan's particulars will be a terrible realization that the Baron can find sympathy for. Here, the Baron shows himself for a certainty to not be a sadist, as he explains that he inflicts pain out of necessity, and just because this is how his plan must be carried out, that doesn't mean he has to like it. Later on, he even expresses his reluctance to torture Duke Leto, partially because he doesn't enjoy violence, but also because he knows if he tortures him, that it could set a violent precedent, one that would show that royalty can be harmed in such a cruel way, a cruelty that the Baron can envision coming back to bite him in the future, a notion that only highlights the pragmatic nature of his mind. Even in his request for his nephew to subjugate the people of Arrakis, he advises him to crush them into submission rather than wipe them out, as if he completely exterminated the populace of Arrakis, who would be left to toil for the Baron and provide him with income. Now the film adaptations seem to have no qualms about committing violent acts, and while the Denny Villanova version isn't what you would call a sadist, he does kill Dr. Yue himself rather than having Piter do so, and the David Lynch version is definitely a sadist. Now, none of the Baron's machinations would be possible without the resources to accomplish his plan, and there is one resource more important than any other in any plan, manpower. Some leaders inspire loyalty, a sense of duty, or a common cause to be championed. But then there are leaders like Baron Harkonnen, leaders who control their hordes of minions through fear and their desires. The Baron is a man who inspires little to no love from his people. But the Baron is wealthy, and his wealth enables him to prey on the greed and vices of his people. He promises Piter Jessica and later Dukedom of Arrakis in exchange for his services. He entices Fade Rautha with the promise of one day inheriting his position, and when Fade is conspiring against him, he assures him that if he keeps his uncle living, he can help him achieve a greater power, the throne of the Empire. When he recruits a new captain of his guard, Nefud, he ensures this man will be loyal by using his knowledge of his addiction, assuring him that he'll never want for his precious drug again should he remain a faithful member of the Baron's entourage. He persuades Hawat to join his forces by promising him a place in his ranks, a purpose for the Mentat, now that his former masters have met their demise. And underscoring all of these promises is an even greater promise, the promise that if they should betray the Baron, there's always someone else caught in his golden web, ready to do his bidding and dispose of any treachery among his ranks. However, the downside to this is that his subordinates learn from his behavior, and Fade, at one point, attempts to end the Baron's life 
by playing on the Baron's own desires, planting a poisonous needle in the thigh of a slave boy the Baron enjoyed, highlighting how this treacherous behavior isn't without its repercussions, no matter how pragmatic a person may be. And it should also be noted that the Baron often finds himself in a disadvantageous position due to the bumbling efforts of his incompetent subordinates, an unfortunate byproduct of employing morally corrupt henchmen. Though the Baron will provide people useful to him with wealth and security, it would seem that the people he rules over receive no such comfort, and during a ceremony on Gady Prime to confirm fate as his heir, the Countess Fenring observes that the capital, Harko, is filthy and in disrepair, which indicates that the Baron hoards his wealth just as he hoards food, sharing little with others, unless he absolutely has to, which only serves to highlight his immense greed. Now why is the Baron so adept at manipulating people through their desires? Because the Baron doesn't just understand human desire, the Baron is human desire, human want made flesh. The Baron may not be a sadist, but he is a hedonist, and the Baron's desires are what fuel every action he takes. He's pursuing greater wealth for his house in order to provide for himself a limitless fountain from which he can draw his deepest desires without restraint. He's warring against his enemies to secure this wealth, but also because it serves to enhance his own power, a power that he enjoys taking just as much as he enjoys having it. And though the Baron doesn't enjoy violence on a carnal level, he is a cunning tactician, and he enjoys the plotting and scheming that come with a good malicious plan, reveling at the thought of his forces overcoming his enemy due to his own intelligence, and he absolutely enjoys the political maneuvering he must employ in order to get the better of his enemies. Though we have no knowledge of the Baron enjoying drugs or alcohol, his other vices more than compensate for a lack of addiction to mind-altering substances. And the Baron has an intense addiction to food, one that has caused him to put on so much weight that he requires suspensers to help him walk. In the book, he does walk, but in the films and the TV series, he's portrayed as either being too fat or too lazy to walk, and he instead floats to move around. Aside from what I've mentioned, all of what we've discussed so far regarding the Baron's personality and machinations are more or less present in each iteration of his character. But now we need to discuss what is different between all four iterations to a varying degree. His outward personality, appearance, and mannerisms. In the book, the way the Baron speaks or acts isn't described in detail all too much, but he is said to have a basso voice, and his choice of words indicate that he's pompous, conniving, and facetious, and he speaks to people in an affectionate way, often referring to them as, my dear. The way he moves is obviously sluggish and awkward, and when he walks, he is described as performing an odd mixture of waddling and gliding. He has a tenderness to him, caressing objects or himself when he speaks, a compulsive touching highlighting his movements. But other than that, the obese Baron isn't a man who is prone to moving much. Other than being extremely overweight, the Baron is described in the books as having baby-like features, having chubby cheeks and fat hands that are reminiscent of a newborn. And he wears finery in accordance with his wealth, adorning his hands and clothing with jewels. In the Denny Villanova adaptation, we receive a more muted version of the Baron, one who's clad in plain clothing, his suspensors grafted to his spine, his smooth features not quite baby-like, but certainly close. From what we've seen so far, he isn't as tender or condescending as he is in the book. Instead, this Baron is much more reserved, speaking little and projecting a much more menacing aura. The David Lynch version is the exact opposite, as he is much more over the top and maniacal, his depravity manifesting itself more outwardly in his devious cackling and his erratic wide-eyed movements and speech. The Baron here appears with a shock of red hair on a sweat-covered balding head, his face covered in pustules and blisters, an infectious representation of the rot that festers within his soul. He wears little finery in this rendition, instead opting to wear leather trench coats over the odd suspensor contraption that surrounds his body. The miniseries Baron is the most decadent of them all, appearing to us as more of a classic nobleman, a full head of red hair, red luxurious clothing, and a much more composed and haughty demeanor. This Baron is prone to rhyming and the self-satisfied manner of speaking that we would come to expect of the Baron we see in the book but he does differ in his delivery and mannerisms, being much more dramatic and mobile than his literary counterpart. However, none of these differences matter too much in the end, as they all meet their deaths at the hands of Aaliyah Atreides, a knife in the dark that the Baron's planning could not account for. And at this end, who was Baron Vladimir Harkonnen?
He was a thoroughly hedonistic and overindulgent man with immense planetary, political, and military power at his disposal, one who sought to supplant the powers that be and place himself and his family at the heights of imperial power. In his quest to see this dream realized, the Baron employed every underhanded tactic in the book, manipulation, sabotage, intimidation, torture, and surprise military action, all for the benefit of a few people, chief among them, himself. He's a gross representation of what terrible things a terrible man can do when he has access to immense power. The embodiment of selfishness, who sees only what he wants and what the people around him can do to satisfy those wants. Cruel, gluttonous, and greedy, Baron Harkonnen was a man whose ambitions lay solely in satisfying his own desires. A man who took advantage of who knows how many lives and ended who knows how many countless more. And he was a thoroughly repugnant and abhorrent man whose abundance of corpulent flesh hid a malignant and calculating evil. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on the Baron? Did I miss anything? Let me know down below, and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured in a future episode while you're at it. If you liked this video and want to see more like it appearing in your feed, click the subscribe button to keep up on the latest episodes, and feel free to leave a like while you're at it. Thank you once again to all of my existing subscribers for your continued and incredible support. If you'd like to support the channel even further, consider signing up as a patron over on Patreon you can find a link to Patreon down in the description. Thank you to everyone who signed up so far, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now. Join the channel's Discord server to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed in the description for occasional updates on the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.